Chapter Nine of Varney the Vampire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Varney the Vampire, Volume One, by Thomas Prescott Prest. Chapter Nine. The occurrences of the night at the hall, the second appearance of the vampire, and the pistol shot. Despite the free and full consent which Flora had given to her brothers to entrust her solely to the care of her mother and her own courage at the hall, she felt greater fear creep over her after they were gone than she chose to acknowledge. A sort of presentiment appeared to come over her that some evil was about to occur, and more than once she caught herself almost in the act of saying, I wish they had not gone. Mrs. Bannerworth, too, could not be supposed to be entirely destitute of uncomfortable feelings, when she came to consider how poor a guard she was over her beautiful child, and how much terror might even deprive of the little power she had, should the dreadful visitor again make his appearance. But it is but for two hours, thought Flora, and two hours will soon pass away. There was, too, another feeling, which gave her some degree of confidence, although it arose from a bad source, inasmuch as it was one which showed powerfully how much her mind was dwelling on the particulars of the horrible belief in the class of supernatural beings, one of whom she believed had visited her. That consideration was this. The two hours of absence from the hall of its male inhabitants would be from nine o'clock until eleven, and those were not the two hours during which she felt that she would be most timid on account of the vampire. It was after midnight before, she thought, when it came, and perhaps it may not be able to come earlier. It may not have the power until that time to make its hideous visits, and therefore I will believe myself safe. She had made up her mind not to go to bed until the return of her brothers, and she and her mother sat in a small room that was used as a breakfast room, and which had a latticed window that opened onto the lawn. This window had, on the inside, strong oaken shutters, which had been fastened as securely as their construction would admit of, some time before the departure of the brothers and Mr. Marchdale on that melancholy expedition, the object of which, if it had been known to her, would have added so much to the terrors of poor Flora. It was not even guessed at, however remotely, so that she had not the additional affliction of thinking that while she was sitting there, a prey to all sorts of imaginative terrors, they were perhaps gathering fresh evidence, as indeed they were, of the dreadful reality of the appearance which, but for the collateral circumstances attendant upon its coming and its going, she would fain have persuaded herself was but the vision of a dream. It was before nine that the brothers started, but in her own mind Flora gave them to eleven, and when she heard ten o'clock sound from a clock which stood in the hall, she felt pleased to think that in another hour they would surely be at home. "'My dear,' said her mother, "'you look more like yourself now. "'Do I, mother? "'Yes, you are well again. "'Ah, if I could forget! "'Time, dear Flora, will enable you to do so, "'and all the rest of what made you so unwell will pass away. "'You will soon forget it all. "'I will hope to do so. "'Be assured that, some day or another, "'something will occur, as Henry says, "'to explain all that has happened, "'in some way consistent with reason "'and the ordinary nature of things,' my dear Flora. Oh, I will cling to such a belief. I will get Henry, upon whose judgment I know I can rely, to tell me so, and each time that I hear such words from his lips, I will contrive to dismiss some portion of the terror which now, I cannot but confess, clings to my heart. Flora laid her hand upon her mother's arm, and in a low, anxious tone of voice said, Listen, mother. Mrs. Bannerworth turned pale, as she said, Listen to what, dear? Within these last ten minutes, said Flora, I have thought three or four times that I heard a slight noise without. Nay, mother, do not tremble. It may be only fancy. Flora herself trembled, and was of a death-like paleness. Once or twice she passed her hand across her brow, and altogether she presented a picture of much mental suffering. They now conversed in anxious whispers, and almost all they said consisted in anxious wishes for the return of the brothers and Mr. Marchdale. "'You will be happier and more assured, my dear, with some company,' said Mrs. Bannerworth. "'Shall I ring for the servants, and let them remain in the room with us, until they who are our best safeguards next to heaven return? "'Hush! hush! hush, mother! "'What do you hear? "'I thought—I heard a faint sound. 
"'I heard nothing, dear. Listen again, mother. Surely I could not be deceived so often. I have now at least six times heard a sound as if someone was outside by the windows. No, no, my darling, do not think. Your imagination is active and in a state of excitement. It is, and yet, believe me, it deceives you. I hope to heaven it does.' There was a pause of some minutes' duration, and then Mrs. Bannerworth again urged slightly the calling of some of the servants, for she thought that their presence might have the effect of giving a different direction to her child's thoughts. But Flora saw her place her hand upon the bell, and she said, "'No, mother, no, not yet, not yet. Perhaps I am deceived.' Mrs. Bannerworth upon this sat down, but no sooner had she done so than she heartily regretted she had not rung the bell for, before another word could be spoken, there came too perceptibly upon their ears for there to be any mistake at all about it, a strange scratching noise upon the window outside. A faint cry came from Flora's lips, as she exclaimed, in a voice of great agony, "'Oh, God! Oh, God! It has come again!' Mrs. Bannerworth became faint, and unable to move or speak at all. She could only sit like one paralyzed, and unable to do more than listen to and see what was going on. The scratching noise continued for a few seconds, and then altogether ceased. Perhaps under ordinary circumstances such a sound outside the window would have scarcely afforded food for comment at all, or, if it had, it would have been attributed to some natural effect, or to the exertions of some bird or animal to obtain admittance to the house. But there had occurred now enough in that family to make any little sound of wonderful importance, and these things which before would have passed completely unheeded, at all events without creating much alarm, were now invested with a fearful interest. When the scratching noise ceased, Flora spoke in a low, anxious whisper, as she said, "'Mother, you heard it?' Mrs. Bannerworth tried to speak, but she could not, and then suddenly, with a loud clash, the bar, which on the inside appeared to fasten the shutters strongly, fell as if by some invisible agency, and the shutters now, but for the intervention of the window, could be easily pushed open from without. Mrs. Bannerworth covered her face with her hands, and, after rocking to and fro for a moment, she fell off her chair, having fainted with the excess of terror that came over her. For about the space of time in which a fast speaker could count twelve, Flora thought her reason was leaving her, but it did not. She found herself recovering, and there she sat, with her eyes fixed upon the window, looking more like some exquisitely chiselled statue of despair than a being of flesh and blood, expecting each moment to have its eyes blasted by some horrible appearance, such as might be supposed to drive her to madness. And now again came the strange knocking or scratching against the pane of glass of the window. This continued for some minutes, during which it appeared likewise to Flora that some confusion was going on at another part of the house, for she fancied she heard voices and the banging of doors. It seemed to her as if she must have sat looking at the shutters of that window a long time before she saw them shake, and then one wide hinged portion of them slowly opened. Once again horror appeared to be on the point of producing madness in her brain, and then as before a feeling of calmness rapidly ensued. She was able to see plainly that something was by the window, but what it was she could not plainly discern, in consequence of the light she had in the room. A few moments, however, sufficed to settle that mystery, for the window was opened, and a figure stood before her. One glance, one terrified glance, in which her whole soul was concentrated, sufficed to show her who and what the figure was. There was a tall, gaunt form, there was the faded, ancient apparel, the lustrous, metallic-looking eyes, its half-opened mouth, exhibiting tusk-like teeth. It was— Yes, it was the vampire. It stood for a moment gazing at her, and then, in the hideous way it had attempted before to speak, it apparently endeavoured to utter some words which it could not make articulate to human ears. The pistols lay before Flora. Mechanically she raised one, and pointed it at the figure. It advanced a step, and then she pulled the trigger. A stunning report followed. There was a loud cry of pain, and the vampire fled. The smoke and confusion that was incidental to the spot prevented her from seeing if the figure walked or ran away. She thought she heard a crashing sound among the plants outside the window, as if it had fallen, but she did not feel quite sure. It was no effort of any reflection, but a purely mechanical movement 
that made her raise the other pistol, and discharge that likewise in the direction the vampire had taken. Then, casting the weapon away, she rose, and made a frantic rush from the room. She opened the door, and was dashing out, when she found herself caught in the circling arms of someone who either had been there waiting, or who had just at that moment got there. The thought that it was the vampire, who by some mysterious means had got there, and was about to make her his prey, now overcame her completely, and she sunk into a state of utter insensibility on the moment. End of chapter 9